This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kay Savitz. Charles Brannan was program editor at Compute Publications from 1980 until 1986. He wrote and edited articles for Compute Magazine and Compute's Gazette. His LinkedIn profile says that his primary responsibility was crafting basic and assembly language software creations. Secondary was managing other young programmers. Charles wrote and ported many type-in programs for the Atari 8-bit and other computers. His Atari programs included FontMaker, a character set editor, and the Atari Wedge for adding commands to Atari Basic. His most popular and well-known program was SpeedScript, an assembly language word processor that was available first for the Commodore 64 in the March 1985 issue of Compute Magazine. In subsequent issues, one month after another, versions were published for the VIC-20, then Atari 8-bits, then the Apple II. Each version was a type-in listing that, after excruciating hours of careful entry, would build a powerful, functional word processor. Charles wrote a couple of books about SpeedScript, one specific to the Atari and one specific to the Commodore versions, which contained the manual, type-in program code, and commented assembly language source code. I've been trying to get an interview with Charles Brennan since 2015 to talk about his time at Compute in general and SpeedScript specifically. This year, I heard back from his wife, Margaret, who told me that Charles suffered a traumatic brain injury in 2016 and no longer feels confident about his memory, so I won't be able to interview Charles. But Tom Halfhill, Charles' old friend and colleague from Compute, volunteered to talk to me about Charles. Tom was supervisor at Compute when Charles wrote SpeedScript and often discussed which features to include and the problems he encountered. Tom worked at Compute Publications from 1982 to 1988, starting as the first features editor for Compute Magazine and later becoming editor. He was the launch editor of Compute's Gazette for the Commodore, Compute's Atari ST Disk and Magazine, Compute's PC Junior Magazine, and Compute's PC Magazine. This is not the first time I've talked with Tom. I interviewed him about his time at Compute back in 2016. This time I talked with him with an emphasis on Charles Brannan and SpeedScript. To be perfectly honest, we stuck to those topics for a good 35 minutes. After that, we found other interesting things to talk about, most of which I left in this episode. This interview took place on July 22nd, 2021. Charles has had... um... I don't want to go into details, but he's had chronic health problems for a long time. So uh, he's just not up to doing interviews. He really isn't. He has nothing personal. I understand. Before we get uh, too much into him, let's, uh, I'd like to talk about you. We, I interviewed you five years ago. Um, and at the time, you were a technology analyst specializing in microprocessors. So my question for you is, uh, hi, how you doing? What are you up to now? I'm doing fine, and I retired from that job on uh, May 1st, 2020, just about a year and a half ago. Um, So I'm full-time retired. Uh, It was a planned retirement, although it happened with the pandemic, so it's been kind of a strange initial retirement. I can't, haven't been traveling anywhere. Um, When I left uh, the company, my boss was very good to me, so I said, if you ever get a pinch and need some help, pitch in, you know, do some freelance work for you. So he's called upon me a few times. I've got an article in progress now. And um, he also uh, gave me a seat on the editorial board of Microprocessor Report, which is an unpaid position. I just review articles before publication and uh, maybe sometimes participate in the technical conferences. So basically I'm retired. So just pursuing personal interests. Nice. And what do those include? Uh, Photography, um, travel when I get a chance to travel again, catching up on reading. Um, I spent about a year donating um, almost 500 photographs to my university, Um, mostly pictures I took when I was a student there that have now had historical value for various reasons. Uh, That took a lot of time documenting the photographs, digitizing them, so forth. So I completed that project. So um, Basically, now I'm just, uh, like I say, doing occasional freelance, um, catching up on reading, getting ready to travel when I can. 
All right, so let's uh, talk about uh, Charles Brannan and, and SpeedScript. Um, you sound like you're the person who probably knows the most about his, his time there and, and about that, that project. Can you tell me how you were involved with, with him? Were you, you know, like his boss or coworkers or how did that work? I wasn't his direct supervisor. Um, I'll tell you the story. When I, I started at Compute Magazine in May of 1982, and I moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, which is where the magazine was based, uh, from Ohio. I was living in Cleveland before that. And um, Charles was still in high school then. And he was working part-time at Compute Magazine. He'd come in after school for a few hours um, every week. And he was basically employed as a tester programmer. So when people submitted programs to be published in the magazine, he would test them, fix any bugs, make any improvements he thought they needed. And then he also would write some original programs as well. And um, when I started there, uh, it was a 10 year uh, difference in our ages, but I, we became instant friends. Uh, Charles was a very friendly, intelligent person. Um, and I knew immediately he was very intelligent and talented. Uh, I'm a programmer too, a hobby programmer, but to me, when I program, I have to sit there and really think about the code I'm writing. Charles is one of those people who is as fluent in code as I am in English. The code just seems to flow from his fingertips. He's very fast and adept programmer. I was very impressed. I'd never seen anybody like that before. And um, he helped me, uh, he taught me a lot about programming and I helped him with writing, which he's also pretty good at. Um, but when I first came, we became fast friends and he showed me a project he was working on, which was basically a prototype of speed script, um, but it was incomplete. He actually wrote it in a language called Forth, F-O-R-T-H, which is kind of obscure nowadays, but in those days it was briefly becoming popular as a language for scientists and astronomers and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, a different kind of language than say basic. Um, somebody had sent a review copy of a Forth package to compute. He was using that, but it was an incomplete package. It didn't have the IO package, the input output package. So he had a screen editor up and running. You could type and edit text on the screen, but you couldn't save it uh, on disk and you couldn't load it. You know, it was just a, just a screen editor. But nevertheless, it was like a prototype of what he wanted to do. So um, after fooling with that for a while and learning about screen editing, programming that, eventually the next project he did was um, he wrote a word processor for Atari 8-bit computers. And, you know, I can't remember the name of it now. We published it in Compute Magazine. It wasn't SpeedScript, this was before SpeedScript. And it was written partly in basic and partly in machine language. A type in program for subscribers of the magazine. And um, it got pretty good response, but it was kind of sluggish in a way because it was partly written in basic. And, um, by the way, he, we got some, he got some criticism from readers because every time you pressed a key, it would make that little chirp, you know, that the Atari makes when you push a key. Sure. And people said, well, if you remove that little chirp, it would be faster responding. But that had nothing to do with that. The little chirp was generated by an interrupt at the machine level. So it had nothing to do with slowing down his uh, program. But anyway, um, we published that uh, program for the Atari and he wasn't fully satisfied because it was kind of sluggish. So that's, so then later, I can't remember, it was maybe several months later, he decided to write a word processor completely in machine language. 6502 machine language or assembly language as some people call it nowadays. Um, and so he took on that project. And at the time, um, I wasn't his direct supervisor. I think he reported at that time, maybe directly to Richard Mansfield, our managing editor, but I'm not sure. Anyway, because Charles and I were friends and we had worked on this, uh, I'd given him input before on his previous attempts to make a word processor. We consulted each other a lot. He would ask me like, what about this feature or that, or I'm stuck on this problem, et cetera. So it was kind of a development project. He did all the programming, of course. I didn't do any of it. He wrote the whole thing himself. And I think the first version was for the Commodore 64, um, which was very popular then had just come out. So. Um, some of the features I know we discussed was uh, he was having some kind of problem with the screen editor 
uh, moving the cursor freely around by character. And then he kind of decided that, you know, for a word processor, it really makes sense to, word, to move by words as well as characters. So he had like word right and word left keys built into the program, which I thought was kind of clever. Um, it was a way of moving more quickly around the text. Um, and then another problem I remember he solved was in those days, a lot of people used their TV sets as a video monitor instead of having a dedicated video monitor. That was common. All the home computers in those days were had a built-in RF converter to plug into your TV set. The problem with TV sets is they weren't made to have computers plugged into them. So they had this problem called overscan. And sometimes, depending on how the TV was adjusted, you'd lose maybe a little bit of text on the left or the right of the screen. It would, it would be scanned off the screen. They called it overscan. You didn't notice it when you're watching television programs, but on a, when you put a computer into it, you'd be losing a little strip of words at the left or right or something. So he put this feature into SpeedScript where you could narrow the column on the screen. Normally the Commodore 64 had a 40 column screen. He had a key you could press that would pinch it in on both sides, make it like 38. And then just as a exercise, he decided to make it basically go as far as you want. You could, you could keep pinching it in. In fact, he got it, to, you could go all the way down to a single column of letters <laughs> going right down the middle of the screen. And of course it wasn't practical. He was just showing that, yeah, I can do this. You could actually do it that way, but it did have a practical thing. Like if you were maybe writing text for to print out, maybe you wanted it to be only 20 columns wide or something, you could make it 20 columns wide. I mean, I mean, yeah, 20 columns of tech characters. So you put that feature in there. So we talked a lot about some of these features like that. I can't remember all of them, um, but it was, uh, it was an interesting development pro pro process. And amazingly, he wrote this thing in, just like a month or two, I think. Maybe it was like a month to write the basic thing and then maybe he spent like another month debugging it. He would pass out copies around the office. People would use it actually to write articles for the magazine and give them feedback. He'd fix bugs or add a feature here or tweak something there. So the whole development thing was like, I don't remember it being more than about two months um, and one person as the programmer, which is you know, pretty amazing when you think about it. Yeah. And um, then we published it and um, it immediately became very popular. And then later, of course, we did some ports to other computers, um, Atari 8-bit, um, there was a VIC-20 version. Um, somebody yeah. later, Randy Thompson, another programmer later wrote a, a PC version in Pascal. Um, that was a completely there different version. There was an Apple II version as well. Yeah, that's right, Apple II. Uh, Charles didn't write all the versions. We had, by that time, we had other programmers on staff who were more familiar with different computers. So um, I think some other programmers wrote some of the other versions. I think Charles wrote the Atari and the Commodore 64 and the VIC versions, and maybe somebody else wrote the Apple version. I can't remember. It seems like really an audacious idea to like for a computer magazine. I mean, a computer, of course, always had type in programs and little games and, and, and of various sizes, but kind of a big idea to go, we're going to make an entire complete feature complete word processor and then publish it and then make people type it in. It was audacious, especially because it was written all in machine language, it was a big project at the time, but also it had to be short enough you could publish a type in listing. And you know, I think the whole thing was, I'm sure it was less than eight kilobytes. It might have even been like four or five kilobytes. I can't remember how big it was, but that was like I mean, nowadays, just the startup screen of a program is, you know, megabytes. <laughs> so uh, he, he got it packed down pretty tight. Um, it was very tight code. Uh, frankly, I don't know how he did it, but uh, he got it done. And it was so popular that it began taking business away from some of the commercial word processors that were out in those days. And I think I told this story before on the previous interview you did with me five years ago. Um, we had a company come in, they, they made a word processor for Commodore. It was a commercial company and their, uh, one of their executives came in, I think two or three of them were there at this meeting and they were basically complaining that we were ruining their business. We were taking their business away from because SpeedScript was, was competing with their word processor, which cost, you know, money. And, um, we sat there, there were several of us in the meeting. We sat there quietly as they reamed us out. They were an advertiser. Um, and they were, when they were done, it was like the silence. And then I couldn't hold myself back. 
I'm not very diplomatic. I said, well, you know, speech group was written by one 18 year old programmer in about a month. If your staff of professional programmers can't do better than that, then you don't deserve to be in business. <laughs> and there was this like stunned silence over the room. And I thought, oh damn, I just blew like 50,000 bucks worth of advertising for the magazine. <laughs> but I didn't get in trouble. They eventually did stop advertising and go out of business. I don't know if it was all speech scripts fault or not. Uh, but really it was as, at, as the type of word processors that were out in those days, speech script was basically commercial quality. Sure. Let's see, in December 1985, uh, Compute said, since its publication in the March, April, May, and June 1985 issues of Compute, because a different version would come out every month, uh, response to SpeedScript 3.0 word processor for the Commodore, VIC-20, Atari, and Apple computers has been tremendous. Hundreds of readers have written to comment on SpeedScript, ask questions, and report minor bugs. Um, it seems like that could have instantly, I mean, I don't know how much mail and feedback you got generally, but it seems like that might have suddenly become like a, just a major part of the, the workflow there at the magazine is dealing with this one program. Yeah, we did get a lot of mail on it, more than just about anything, uh, almost all positive. Uh, we published some of the letters. Um, uh, we didn't get much negative feedback. That most of the negative things were people who couldn't get it to work when they typed it in. And of course, we knew the code was good. And we had this um, we had this thing, I forgot what it was called now. It was a, a little program to help you type in machine language programs. MLX. MLX, yeah, MLX, which was which, which Charles Brennan also wrote. Yeah, that's right. So you type in a line of numbers, and then at the last number would be a checksum to make sure that the previous numbers were okay. So it increased the amount of typing you had to do, but it increased the chance that you type it in correctly. But nevertheless, some people somehow got it wrong or whatever. So we had to assure people, yeah, it really worked. You know, we didn't have a, a bulletin board system in those days where people could download it. You had to type it in. Uh, what happened though is. Some people would type it in, get it to work, and they'd share it with a user group, which were big in those days. They would just share it around, um, which wasn't strictly legal if they weren't subscribers, but nevertheless, that's what happened. Um, the only um, area where SpeedScript didn't fully compete with the commercial word processors was in printing. It could print, but I don't think it had quite as many formatting features as some of the commercial word processors had especially because there was all different kinds of printers in those days and you had to have different printer drivers for different printers and it was a real mess. Um, but other than that, it was pretty, it was fast and easy to use. Do you remember why SpeedScript was out of the gate at version 3.0? No, I don't, except that, like I said, we did, while we were refining it, we did pass copies around the office. So people would be using it not just for testing, but even like I say, to write actual articles for the magazine, they give feedback to Charles, say, hey, I found this little bug or gee, I really like this feature to be added or whatever. So he'd go back and work on it. So my guess is that 1.0 and 2.0 were the internal versions that we were using uh, before it was published. And then I think somebody uh, else on staff wrote a spell checker for it. Um, I'm trying to remember. I, I, I don't want to be wrong, but um, I thought it might have been one of our uh, technical editors, uh, maybe Otis Cooper, but I'm not sure. Somebody wrote a uh, spell checker and included like a dictionary. I think it was like a several thousand word dictionary that was already pre-made for it. We, we ended up publishing that. Um, there were other add-ons that people sent in as well. I think some people sent in add-ons to improve the uh, printing formatting and various other things that got added over time. It was quite a project. Sure. And then uh, SpeedScript was released as a, as a couple of books, um, just a, a book of the type in version, but, but also the source code, uh, the commented source code. Right. Right, yeah, we, we had a book publishing division pretty early on. In fact, when they hired me at Compute, they wanted me to be the book editor, but I didn't want that job. So they offered me features editor instead. But yeah, we would, uh, most of the books we published were reprints of the articles. We'd collect a bunch of articles around a certain subject or computer and publish them. Um, and uh, then with SpeedScript, it basically was a standalone. 
you know, it was like the whole book just on speed script. Like I say, the source code, the type in machine language code, maybe some add-ons. I might have a copy of that book somewhere. I don't remember. I saved some of the compute books that I contributed to or edited, um, but <laughs> I don't have them all. But yeah, it was a book. And then, like I say, later, Randy Thompson, who was one of our uh, programmers, he wrote a, a PC version in Pascal, Turbo Pascal, which was a fast and um, popular language then for Atari, I mean, for, excuse me, for PC. And actually, I used that for uh, years. Um, when I later left compute and ended up at uh, Byte magazine, a few years later, I was using uh, the PC version of SpeedScript to write articles for Byte magazine for a few years. The only thing I really I stopped using it is because I think it had a limit of uh, 64k characters or something like that, and I was starting to write cover stories for Byte that were longer. I, I couldn't fit it into the uh, speed script, so I had to use something else. But you know, to this day, I'm still uh, a fan of very simple text editors like speed script. What I use now to write all my articles is a um, on the PC, I use a program called uh, Text Edit, and on the Mac, uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's called Word Wrangler or something. These are basically text editors designed for programmers. Mm -hmm. They have features like code coloring, you know, if you're writing code, but they're just basic text editors like SpeedScript was. And I prefer to write, you know, just a plain Jane text editor. And then when I'm ready to submit an article, I'll just, you know, paste it into a template in Microsoft Word, you know, for submission. Um, but I still do all my writing in text editors like SpeedScript. Uh, yeah, Text Wrangler on the Mac is great. I think that's the one you're referring to. By Bear yeah, Software. I see the icon down here right now. Yeah, yeah, Text Wrangler. Yeah, I use its Big Brother I have an old uh, version. BB Edit. It's very nice. Um, yeah, and by the way, there were some really bad text uh, word processors for computers in those days. Uh, for a while before SpeedScript, um, I had a Commodore 8032. Um, to use as my word processor when mm -hmm. I first came to compute. This was a, an improvement on the Commodore PET, the original Commodore PET. The 8032 was so-called because it had an 80 column text screen as opposed to 40 column on the Commodore PET and it had 32K of RAM, whereas the original PET I think had 8K. It was actually a pretty good machine for that purpose, except the, I can't remember the name of the word processor it was. It was Word Pro maybe or something. It was written by a programmer in Canada and it used to drive me crazy. Um, it had a very short limit of words it could handle also. And then one time I was screaming at it, uh, Robert Locke came by, wanted to know what was going on. I was threatening to murder the programmer, I think, who wrote it because it had this feature where, you know, normally in a, in a text editor, you hold down a control key and then you push another key to use a certain command, you know, like control E for erase or something or control D for delete. But on this program, when you hit the control key, it worked like a toggle. If you hit it, it would stay in control mode until you hit it again. So if you bump that control key by accident, you're in command mode instead of text mode. And if you hit any keys, it would start executing commands. Well, I was writing a, uh, an article and I wanted to, I was typing the word early as the beginning of the sentence. I remember this distinctly, E-A-R-L-Y. And I hit, I meant to hit shift E for a capital E, instead I hit the control key and hit E, which was the command for erase. And then the next key I hit was A, which it was still in command mode. So it was erase all. So it erased my entire text. The entire article just vanished off my screen in a flash. And then I realized what I had done. And I was like screaming at the computer. Um, I can't remember the programmer's name, but I was screaming, next time I go to CES or Convex, I'm gonna kill this guy, you know? <laughs> And Robert Locke, who was the, 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 the owner of the company, came, he would walk by my office that moment and said, what's wrong with Tom? He's normally this calm person. You know, he's, he's screaming at his computer. Uh, but anyway, uh, and then Richard Mansfield came in and he tried to use the uh, built-in machine language editor on the, on the Commodore to retrieve my text. He thought, well, maybe it's still in memory somewhere. You know, just erased it off the screen. He went searching through memory, but he couldn't find it. So it was a lost cause. I had to write the whole article again from scratch. But so there were some really bad word processors then. So that's why speech script was especially important. Um, but I want to give a lot of credit to Charles. It's a shame he can't be interviewed because he wrote this program and it was really a, a great piece of work at the time. 
And later he and Kevin Martin wrote uh, Speed Calc, which was sort of a, a spreadsheet program. Do you have any That's right, I remember that? that too. Yeah. I don't, I wasn't as much involved in that project. Okay. Um, that was of course, of course to compete with uh, the spreadsheets at the time, which was not um, Excel, it was a VisiCalc. VisiCalc, yeah. Yeah, VisiCalc was the first really electronic spreadsheet program. It came out first, I think, on the Apple II, and then there were versions for other computers. So yeah, SpeedCalc was meant to uh, basically compete with VisiCalc. Kevin Martin, I haven't heard that word, in, that name in a long time. He was also a um, high school student, I think, when we hired him. And then later he went on, I, I'm pretty sure he, he, when he graduated high school, he went to Virginia Tech. I don't know whatever happened to him. He was, he was a pretty sharp guy too. After you... I think raised the bar with with speed script and then speed calc was was the next year was there pressure to to keep providing like extreme value in in type in programs it, or was it hard to go back into just little here's a game about a helicopter after that yeah there was some that's partly why speed calc was written i do remember that um but by that time we had a staff of programmers, these were full-time employees. I think we ended up having four or five and they became very expert in writing machine language programs. These, some of these guys could crank out a game, you know, a machine language game in a month. Um, that would be, you know, better than the games written in basic. Um, and often uh, readers would submit a program, a game or some other utility, and then they would write, it would port write ports to other computers. So when we published it, we might have three or four versions for different computers you know, in the same issue. Um, we called these ports homogs, which is kind of an obscure thing. It was an internal name. It was short for homogenizing. Somehow it caught on. You were, were homogenizing some program, meaning we're making it cross-platform. We're writing versions for different computers. It, it would be confusing for newcomers. We'd hire somebody new and they'd say, oh yeah, Patrick's working on the Commodore homog. And they say, what's a homog? <laughs> you know? And we'd explain is what we call port nowadays. Um, but yeah, there was, there was more pressure for utilities um, and uh, applications beyond just games. Um, and you know, eventually it got to the point, that's why really why type in programs kind of disappeared because as the ante kept rising, you just couldn't write commercial level software and have it be a typed in program, it'd be just too much typing. And then of course, later you had BBSs and websites and things for distributing software that way. And we did have some disc magazines. In fact, that's uh, the Commodore magazine that I uh, launched when I was there. I was the launch editor of the Computes Gazette. We had a disc for it, you know, floppy disk you could subscribe to. We put the programs on the disc at extra cost for people who wanted to subscribe and then you didn't have to type in the programs anymore. And then we had an Atari disc and magazine that I also was the launch editor of. Um, had the disc, a three and a half inch floppy bundled right in a plastic baggie with the uh, magazine because it just wasn't practical um, to type in programs that long. And you know, eventually type in programs and magazine programs just kind of disappear altogether. Say, you know, late 1980s roughly it just became a thing that just wasn't sustainable anymore. Right. And some in the, I mean, the nineties, some, a lot of magazines switched to bundling CD-ROMs, but that was, you know, they'd throw in demo programs and, and things like that. But yeah, then they had the problem of, we've got to fill 600 megabytes every month. Right. Yeah. Original programming just kind of vanished pretty much after the 1980s. We did do a thing I also was the launch editor of a uh, PC magazine for compute and we had a disc for it and we would sign up um, shareware authors. So instead of writing original work, we'd go out and scout up some shareware and put it on the disc. And um, we would tell these shareware authors, you, know, you get a royalty depending on how many discs are sold and how much you know, space your program takes up on the disc, you'd get a royalty out of that. Um, so that was a, one way of keeping the, uh, this sort of custom going of having programs built into a magazine. But, you know, over time, people could download shareware from these BBSs 
uh, which is, by the way, for new new viewers of this podcast, it's called a bulletin board system, kind of the precursor to the internet and the World Wide Web. You have to dial in with a modem to a certain computer somewhere, and then you could download programs and so forth. But that kind of took over. So that was kind of like the end of uh, magazines publishing programs. Yeah. So to, all right, so any more stories about about Charles? Um, what uh, and yet just just fishing here, but in, you know what what would he tell me if uh, I could talk to him? Well, I can tell you two stories that are kind of amusing. This one story happened pretty early when I joined Compute, and uh, he was still I think in high school, and uh, he was working on this game program for the magazine. I don't think it was an original one. I, I think he, he maybe was working on one that somebody submitted and trying to improve it or something, but it involved animating some object around the screen. And for some reason, it kept jumping randomly around the screen now and then, and he couldn't figure out why. This was on the Atari 800. And he spent like days and days trying to find the bug in his program, and he just could not find anything. He had a machine language routine that was moving this object around um, on a vertical blank interrupt. And he just could not find what the problem was. So finally, in desperation, he called one of our columnists, um, Bill Wilkinson. He was a columnist for Compute Magazine at the time. And he had actually written the Atari operating system, his company, mm -hmm. yeah. which was called OSS, Optimized System Software. Yeah. And um, in desperation, he said, he's the most Atari expert we know outside of Atari. So he called Wilkinson and he talked about it over the phone. And what it turned out was this uh, vertical blank interrupt routine that Charles was using uh, to animate his object, um, it would activate uh, decimal mode in the 6502 microprocessor. In other words, most microprocessors compute in binary, right? Zeros and ones. But the, believe it or not, the 6502 had a decimal mode that counted in decimal like we do with our finger, you know? And but that was happening. So when he came out of his routine, he was still in decimal mode, and that was throwing off all the math, and that was causing his object to jump around the screen like crazy. So the whole thing that solved it was at the very first, uh, the very last uh, instruction he had to put into his uh, program was uh, an assembly language instruction called CLD, clear decimal. That set it back to binary mode. And that fixed it. That one three letter, you know, single cycle instruction, CLD, clear decimal, that fixed the whole problem he'd spent days trying to solve. He was practically tearing his hair out. And it was so funny because Whenever we hired a new programmer who was working on the Atari machine language, it became like a shop rule. You got to put the CLD thing in your program. And people would say, well, why? And we'd say, well, never mind. We'll explain later. Just do it. <laughs> so the CLD story was a good one. And then a similar thing happened to me. I was, uh, I was writing a program for publication in the magazine. And um, it was a machine language routine. And it, it just wouldn't work. I would call it from basic. And then nothing would happen, and absolutely nothing. It would, the machine wouldn't crash. Nothing funny would happen on the screen. It was just like nothing. And I spent like a week trying to figure out what the bug was, and I couldn't find it. So I finally, I got desperate. I printed out my code, and I come over to Charles, and I said, you know, I spent a week trying to debug this program. I said, just take a look at this for a few hours and see if you can find the bug. He looks at it for like 30 seconds, and he breaks out laughing. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he pointed to this thing. I had a, a loop where I was uh, poking my machine learning routine into memory and I'd forgotten to increment the variable that put the code into memory. So what happened was the only code that got put into memory was the very last instruction in my machine language routine, which was a return from subroutine. So I would jump to my routine and immediately would jump back and do nothing else, <laughs> you know, in like one microsecond. So he like, in 30 seconds, he spots this bug that I didn't, I couldn't find in like a week. And that was Charles, you know, he could, he could just read code like, you know, we read English. He was that fluent in it. And it was just something very simple, just one little instruction I'd forgotten to put in there, you know, I equals I plus one to increment that variable or whatever it was. And um, that's just the kind of programmer he was. I mean, he, his finger just would fly over the keys. He could look at code and just read it. So uh, I guess there's other people like that, but I haven't met many of them in my lifetime. It's always the stupid little bugs that get you. <laughs> yeah yeah i've had i've had a few of those over the years um yeah richard helped me find one of them one time again another machine guide routine i would 
writing a routine that would search through memory for a certain text string. And I forgot to put like a upper limit on it. It would just go roaming through memory until it hit the top topmost memory address and it would crash. So uh, he found that bug for me. But yeah, especially with machine language, it's so touchy. And you don't get any really feedback. You don't get any error messages. Something just doesn't work. What else should I ask you? I don't know, except I'm glad that you uh, did this interview to uh, you know, explain how speech came about and some background on Charles, because he can't do it himself. So uh, it's, it's an important part, I think, of Atari history. Uh, he was a great student of the Atari. Like I say, he actually went out to California one time and visited Bill Wilkinson. He knew the Atari backwards and forwards. Of course, later he also became adept on the Commodore 64. Um, but the Atari was his first love machine like mine, mm -hmm. my first personal computer. So we were always talking about Atari. Um, he helped me upgrade my Atari 800 to that uh, newer graphics chip they had. I think the original graphics chip was something like CTGA or something. And then they came out with one C called the CTIA, CTCA. which the, yeah, became the GTA. Yeah, yeah. something like that. I, yeah. yeah, and we got the, we got the upgrade chip because my Atari was a pretty early one, had the older graphics chip. And we remember he came over to my apartment, we were gonna put this chip in. And uh, when we took that Atari 800 apart, I was just like astonished. It doesn't look that big, the Atari 800. But when you start taking it apart, there were like all these boards that came out. It wasn't like a single motherboard like you got now. There was these daughter boards and everything. And it was like major surgery, open heart surgery, getting in there to replace that chip. And then, I tried to put it in, I couldn't get it in all the way. And Charles says, you gotta push it really hard. And I was afraid to bend the pins. And he said, you just gotta do it, you just gotta do it. He took his thumb and just go thump like that and stuck it in there. I'm like, oh, hope it didn't bend the pins. Um, but it worked fine. And then we had to put it all back together again. Uh, it was like open heart surgery. Um, but yeah, that added, I think that expanded the color range. Was it from 128 to 256 or something? Yeah, I believe that's right. I, I forget. And it added uh, three new graphics models. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, that was no, that was really a great machine, Atari 800. Um, I thought it, I bought it instead of the Apple II because I thought it was just a superior machine, and Charles did too. Do you play with any old computers today? I haven't. In fact, years ago, when I was moving, I tried to pare down on stuff, so I ended up actually giving my Atari 800 and my disk drive and everything to uh, Charles, um, because I had. Uh, I had what I called a golden disk drive and a golden cassette recorder. You know, the, the Atari disk drives and cassette recorders were kind of uh, touchy, um, but I had a disk drive, a floppy disk drive and a cassette uh, recorder that was just like flawless. It always worked. My cassette recorder, I don't know what it was, charmed. Whenever somebody would submit a program on cassette for Atari, if we couldn't get it to read on any of the machines at the office, I'd take it home and my machine could read it. I don't know why. Um, I bought it at a computer store in Cleveland and uh, they were sold to me cheaper than the list price because the counter didn't work. It had one of those little digital counters, mechanical counters. And I took the thing apart and discovered there was some washer that was clogging up the thing. I just took the washer out and then the counter worked fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was like a charm recorder. I gave all that equipment to Charles years ago. Um, so uh, I think I still have some manuals or something, which I, um, might donate to the Computer History Museum. I've donated um, other stuff to them. There's a Computer History Museum in Mountain View down here in Silicon Valley. Sure. I was a volunteer there for years, but I also donated some stuff. A lot of back issues of Byte Magazine and Compute and Compute's Gazette. All those Compute magazines I donated. I donated a Macintosh uh, SE30. Um, you already had an Atari 800, several of those. Um, but yeah, I donated some books and magazines and stuff to them. Uh, but no, I don't have any old computers or emulators. I noticed, um, I used for years, I wrote a column in Maximum PC Magazine. Um, and lately they've been running every month a feature on old computers and where you can find emulators for them, where you can find software for them. And just last month by coincidence, they did a two page spread on the Atari 800. Oh. And they listed some sites online where you can download emulators and software for them. Um, and very occasionally, not much anymore, I'd get an email from somebody asking me about 
programs we published in compute. There was somebody from Italy a few years ago that asked me if I had any Atari programs. And I somehow I found a disk and managed to get it sent to him or something. It had a uh, Pac-Man clone that somebody had written like in basic. And it actually was a very good Pac-Man game. And he was delighted to get it. He said, nobody's ever seen this before. Uh, so no, I don't really, as far as old computers, I have five computers now. And I think the newest one is maybe like five years old. Um, you know, people think techies always have the latest equipment, but my opinion is that techies know how to get the most out of what they got already. <laughs> um, and I don't play games anymore. I haven't played games in a long time. So I don't need really a fast computer or fast graphics. So I've got um, a Windows PC. I've got a MacBook like I'm using right now for the Zoom call, which by the way, this MacBook is, gosh, 12 years old, maybe. Um, still works fine. Um, then I've got two old, um, another old MacBook and another old Windows PC that I've converted to Linux. Um, so I just run Linux on those. It's not dual boot, they just boot directly to Linux. Um, one of them is what I call my travel computer. When I go on vacation or trips, or whatever, I take that because it's basically expendable. You know, it's an old netbook actually that's running Linux. I don't keep any personal files on it. If it gets stolen or broken or lost, you know, it's no big deal. So I take that with me on trips. And then I've got a, a Chromebook, um, which is just nice if you want to boot something up fast and it's impervious to almost any kind of malware that's out there. Um, so those are my five computers. That's not even counting phones and iPads and stuff. Um, actually, my uh, fiance has a faster computer than any of mine. I bought her a MacBook Pro for Christmas a few years ago. She's got the fastest computer in the house. <laughs> and she's not even a techie. <laughs> she's playing online bridge with it right now. Uh, nice. So those are my old computers. Nice. Which are, are, are old, but not like old, old. <laughs> yeah. They're old, but not uh, antique or classic, I guess. Sure. Nice. Yeah. What, which computers do you do? You have any old computers running? I do. I have a uh, an Atari uh, 800 XL that I'm using. Well, for I still have my original Atari 800 that my dad bought when I was a kid that yeah. I originally fell in love with. Um, but I tend to use the 800 XL. Um, there's a, a gadget that came out uh, last year. It's called a FujiNet. And you hook it up to your Atari and it puts it on the internet, like in, in every way possible. It, it thinks hmm. it thinks it's talking to a disk drive, but the disk drive is the internet. So you can, you know, load games off of web servers uh, there. You can have networked games very easily where, you know, you can, two people across the world can, can play and it, it, uh, it just thinks it's talking over the SAO. Um, uh, it, it's a virtual printer, you know, it, which just creates PDF files, and it, it's an amazing gadget, which has really breathed new new life in, into those machines. Um, and uh, I have an Apple II as well. You mentioned online games. I remember Charles one time proposed the idea of publishing a game that people could play, you know, via modem over a phone line. Mm. But I don't think we ever got around to doing it for some logistical reason. Seems like it would depending um, on the era, be tricky. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, it had already been done. There was a Tiris Eddy magazine that had some kind of game you could play versus somebody else over a modem, over a phone line. And we were intrigued by that. And Charles said, you know, we should do a game like that for like Atari or make it so you don't have to have the same kind of computer at each end. An Atari person could play an Apple person, could play a Commodore person, whatever. Yeah, yeah that'd be awesome. Yeah, it'd be awesome. I said, you know, but yeah, but how could you get the, you know, this is the day of 300 baud modems. How could you get the graphics to move that fast over a 300 baud phone connection? And he said, you know, you don't really have to push the graphics over the phone. You just put commands over the phone that tell the graphics what to do at the other end, which is actually how I think the X Windows system used to work um, right. on Unix. Um, so I thought, wow, that's, that's an interesting idea, but I don't think, uh, I can't remember what the reason, what happened, but I don't think we ever ended up doing it. Yeah, I need to resume volunteering. Now that I'm retired, I got more time I can volunteer down there. Sure. Um, that was a lot of fun. I used to work in the library mostly, but I did everything from vacuuming the warehouse to building a cabinet for the dishwasher in the kitchen. I mean, it was, it's a pretty interesting place to volunteer. Nice. Most 
Actually, I volunteered in the library. People donate magazines and they have to be entered into a database and sorted out and so forth. So I was perfect for that because I knew many of the magazines. I've heard that the the Computer History Museum has a has a storage warehouse that's like the the thing out of Indiana Jones with the the giant <laughs> warehouse. Is that is that true? Yes, that's true. It's off site. It's uh, if it's the same warehouse that I when I was there. It's in Milpitas, I believe, in some nondescript place. I went down there one time with a crew of other volunteers, and. I was there all day, just vacuum cleaning the place. Yeah, it's like Indiana Jones. It's got these, um, it looks like a Costco. It's got these really tall shelves, the kind of you can reach only with a forklift. And there's all kinds of stuff there. And some of it's like uh, old mainframes that are wrapped in plastic for preservation until they get restored. Just a treasure house of all kinds of strange stuff. Because they don't have room to display it all. Like most museums have a warehouse or basement like that. Nice. There was another museum uh, that was in Seattle, the Living Computer Museum, which was funded by Paul Allen. Uh, but when he died, I guess he hadn't set it up. That might, I, I have inferred that he hasn't set it up. Uh, he didn't set it up that, that well so that it would continue to get funding after he passed and his sister has no interest in old computers. So for now, the museum is, uh, is shut. And they haven't said if it will be back or not. Yeah, that happens a lot. You know, actually, the Computer History Museum in the Silicon Valley, that originally started as a private collection by the founder of DEC, Digital Equipment Corp, in Massachusetts. And he was displaying some old stuff in the lobby of the DEC office building. And then it later became a computer museum in Boston. And I actually visited it. I think it was around 1980 or 81. Yeah, I was there in vacation in Boston. Yeah, I was there in, I don't know, 92 or 93. Yeah, and they had they had a museum actually that was, I remember it was just down the street from where the Boston Tea Party ship is. And I visited that museum in the early 80s. And um, I think it closed in the early 90s, but I later learned that pretty much that whole collection that they had there was shipped west and acquired by the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley. So it's all the same stuff I saw back in the early 80s is now back here. Um, and that became an important part of their core collection. And then they also acquired a whole bunch of stuff from a private collector in Germany. He had like a garage just full of um, old mainframes and, and uh, mini computers and things. And they acquired all that too, had it shipped over here from Germany. So they've built that collection out of several previous collections. Yeah, if something ever happens to your uh, podcast collection, you got to donate that. Make sure it gets donated to the Computer History Museum because they do oral histories too, you know. Uh, yes, they you know, do. All um, your podcasts are done. I've tried a couple of times to get their attention and just like, hey, you know, uh, but they are either too busy or it's some sort of not built here thing that they're just not interested. So I'm just putting everything up on Internet Archive and uh, I trust that I like that's a nonprofit internet online library. And I, I trust that uh, if, if anyone's man, gonna manage to survive and hold information, it's gonna be them. So um, I put everything there and hope for the best. That's good. You know, I did something similar I mentioned earlier that I donated a bunch of photographs to my university. Same thing, I had some things I wanted to donate in my will. And I decided, you know, when I die, no one's probably gonna bother to do this. <laughs> and I don't wanna burden my um, executor with it. So I just went ahead and did all the donations uh, last year, photographs, uh, some more than 100 years old that my grandmother had uh, from my university, but most of them were pictures I took back in the 70s. And I wanted to make sure they got donated and um, documented because, you know, who else is going to remember who these people are in the pictures when they were taken, you know, details like that. And who else is going to go to the trouble of digitizing them all? It'd be a big job for them. So I did all of that. And um, I did a, deed, a deed of gift contract, which you have to do when you donate something to a museum. So my deed of gift contract um, says I retain the copyrights as long as I'm alive. When I die, they get the copyrights. Um, but in the meantime, they can use my pictures for anything they want for any educational or historical purpose. It's not commercial, but just historical and educational without having to ask me first. So they've got free use of my photos. They can put them up on their website. They can use them in books, magazines, whatever. 
So I made sure that's all, all you know, done in, in ink and everything. So they'll just be they'll just be inherited by them. So you could maybe do something similar. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, my work of four hundred plus interviews, you know, fits on a USB stick. <laughs> I could just mail them out <laughs> everywhere. You know. Yeah. It seems like a lot of work, and yet, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, same thing, you know, my other hobby is genealogy and photography. So I've been scanning family photos and documents for years. I started that project uh, in 1998. And I just working on it again a little bit last night, added a few things I found. And uh, I've got, uh, I don't know, eight or 9,000 photographs and documents. Again, it all fits on a USB stick. But by the way, USB sticks are not archival. Um, they lose their data after a few years. Um, you know, they, they hold data by um, using the capacitance effect of a transistor. Um, there's like trapped electrons in there. And over time, those electrons dissipate. And the rate at which they dissipate depends on the temperature of the storage, if they're near magnetic fields, how big the transistors are, all kinds of factors. Um, but I've had some USB sticks that I put some files on and put it in a drawer and came back three years later and the disk is unreadable. Hmm. The stick is unreadable. You can't read files off of it. It just says, you know, this disk is unformatted. You got to reformat it before you can use it. All the files are just gone, you know, bit rot, they call it, or digital rot. So um, unfortunately, a USB stick is not archival. You have to put it on, like, say, a hard drive is better, um, or a CD or DVD. But my collection is too big to fit on. It would take, you know, I don't know, 50 DVDs or something. Right. I wouldn't trust it. So the DVD, they, they rot they out too. So. Yeah. But I've had more luck with them than I have with the USB sticks. Um, so anyway, we what we need is a non-volatile, more or less permanent storage medium that we don't have yet. Paper. Paper, yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, the cool. photographs I'm scanning were all on paper except for a few tin types go back to the 1800s you got a lot of scars and scratches and dust spots but it's there it's recoverable i've done a lot of work on those so um yeah it's always a problem archiving i notice your podcast you know it's called antic which of course is both the name of a chip in the atari and the name of a famous atari magazine yes uh, jim caparell's old magazine right yeah, he, he was my around? he was my first interview. He's still around. Yeah, we we named it after the magazine after the chip. Um, it's been pointed out to us that we should have named it Pokey because that was the chip in the Atari that made the sound, and it's an audio podcast. So, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> but too late. Also, po Pokey's a terrible name for a podcast. So, yeah, I don't know about that. Um, and then the other Atari magazine was Analog. Yes. Um, I still have the first issues. I have the first issues of Analog and Antic and Compute and Macworld. Um, small collection of first issues, first editions, I guess. Nice. Kind of interesting. I, I, I probably told you this last when we talked a few years ago, but probably bears repeating. I mean, I, I enjoyed Compute magazine so much. I, I read every issue. I, I loved learning from them, about them, even about platforms I didn't own or particularly care about. It was always something to learn. I love the colorful covers, um, you know, browsing through all the, all the ads. And um, it, it, was, it was my, you know, my go-to magazine. And I, I really enjoyed it. And I thank you for the work that you did. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we, we all loved it too. It was, it was, believe me, it was fun working there. We had, we had a great time, um, not just putting the magazines together, and, but also socially. Um, a lot of us on the staff, of course, we were all about the same age then, you know, in our 20s, early 30s. Every summer, we would take uh, camping trips up to the mountains in North Carolina, go whitewater rafting, um, things like that. So it was, a, it was a good social environment, too. We had a lot of good parties. Um, we had... Remember we had a toga party one time. <laughs> it was a that was kind of fun. It was it was a great place to work. 
Um, and uh, it was kind of a shame. Uh, Robert sold it to ABC, which I think later he kind of regretted um, because they kind of took over, became more corporate after that. Um, and they made some changes that we didn't like. But that always happens when, a, when there's a corporate acquisition. You start become, you become part of a big company running by you know, executives out of New York. I, luckily, I left Compute before it was acquired by, um, oh, what's his name? The owner of um, Penthouse Magazine. Uh-huh. Um, um, Bob, Bob something, um, he's dead now. He was, he was the owner of the company General Media, which owned Penthouse Magazine, which was kind of like a sleazy version of Playboy. And um, the magazine kind of went downhill after that. Uh, uh, Guccione. But I was gone by then. Guccione, you're right, Bob Guccione. Yeah, I left shortly before that happened, so I wasn't there. Years and years ago, when I was working on my site, atarimagazines.com, uh, I was pretty vigilant of getting permission for everything that that I put online from, from the copyright holders. I have a somewhere I have a, a, a letter on you know penthouse stationery giving me permission to put uh, uh, stuff mm -hmm. information from from compute on <laughs> online. <laughs> So. Well, now it's a situ now it's a situation where whoever whoever still owns the copyrights to that stuff probably doesn't know they own it. Right. Uh, General Media sold compute to um, I think Ziff Davis, but Ziff Davis bought it only for the list. Mm -hmm. They shut the magazine down. I bought the last issue. They shut the magazine down and then merged the list with one of their other computer magazines. And um, then Ziff Davis, of course, broke up. And pieces were acquired by different other companies. So whoever inherited those copyrights, I'm almost sure, doesn't know they own it. So that's why occasionally I'll get an email from somebody saying, you know, I want to, I want to put this article on my website or something. They say, who do I get copyright permission from? And I say, I don't know. I don't know who to point you to. I said, frankly, I'll just put it up on your website. And if you get a cease and desist letter, you'll be doing us a favor telling us who thinks they own the copyright now. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> nobody knows. Right. Yeah. If they don't know, and if they do know, they don't care. And right. And and it's not worth their in-house lawyer's time to, even if they do know and they do care, it's not worth their time to respond to you and say, yes, you have permission to put this article from 40 years ago on your website. It, it you know, they've got more important things to do. Right. Yeah. Right. And, you know, most of these websites, you're not charging any money for them anyway. You're not making anything. Yeah. Um, there's no revenue that they can get. So it's, it's not like, you know, they're going to make a fortune out of these copyrights. Yeah. Um, same thing with Byte Magazine articles. Uh, they disappeared off the Internet several years ago. Mm -hmm. I put all my, as another project I did in retirement, all my Byte articles, I've reformatted in HTML and put them up on my personal website. Um, but the rest of them are just out there. And the Byte CD-ROM that we issued is no longer readable because we had outsourced the CD-ROM to some company that has proprietary software on the CD-ROM. And when you put that CD-ROM in a modern Windows computer, it can't read it. It can't run the program anymore. Um, that was a real bitch. <laughs> so um, in fact, I had to take one of my old computers I told you about that I got Linux on. I actually took the hard drive out, put the original hard drive back in to run Windows XP so I could run the Byte CD-ROM and pull all my articles off of it. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, so these old copyrights, who knows? Um, and you know, I see a lot of these uh, magazines coming into the Computer History Museum when we're working in the library, same thing. One of the hazards of that job was you get absorbed in reading these old articles. Um, and not just in computer magazines. Somebody donated a whole set of, uh, of these um, journals from Bell, Bell Labs. And you know, if you know Bell Labs back before AT&T was broken up, that was like their R&D division. Sure. Um, yeah. They invented a whole lot of stuff, all the switching equipment you know, for the telephone network and so forth. Well, one of, one of these old journals had an article telling about how they developed proximity fuses in World War II. And a proximity fuse is a, uh, a fuse that's built into a projectile like an artillery shell or an anti-aircraft shell. And 
it causes the shell to explode when it comes near the target. It doesn't have to hit the target. So a near miss just causes it to explode. So it's great for anti-aircraft fire because you don't have to hit the plane. You can just, if your stream of you know, projectiles gets near the plane, it explodes and the shrapnel either kills the pilot or brings the plane down. It was a great invention and also for uh, field artillery against infantry. So this article was a very deep technical article, how they developed these proximity fuses, how they test them and everything. And yet it developed, they didn't have transistors in World War II. The, the proximity fuse has a radio in it that emits a radio wave and then it bounces back and that tells how close it is to the target. Well, you gotta have you know, tubes or transistors for a radio. They didn't have transistors. So they had to make a vacuum tube that could withstand the G-forces of being fired out of a cannon, which was like something like 10,000 Gs or something ridiculous. So they actually made, vacuum tubes that were the size of a grain of rice and were made of metal instead of glass. Um, but just amazing stuff like that in these old old journals and magazines. So you're sitting there in the in the workshop reading the stuff when you're supposed to be cataloging things <laughs> yeah. or sweeping the floor or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The archivist comes by, oh have you got those journals filed yet? I'm like, uh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get absorbed in that stuff. But sure. um oh there's lots of stuff. Yeah seeing those old magazines again, um, a lot of them I never heard of. And then what's amazing is how many magazines go through name changes over the years. As the market changes, they'll change their name and their focus. And so you have to document, oh, this magazine is really this older magazine, just the same thing, same staff, just different name. So I was documenting all that stuff. Um, yeah, it's a shame that computer magazines have pretty much disappeared now. It's all online now. Um, but it's pretty hard to compete with a website. It's a lot cheaper than uh, printing on paper and mailing doing all the mailing and everything. Yeah, but microprocessor. Not, but, not, but not as fun, but not as fun. It was it was great looking forward to like getting that computer magazine in the mail once a month and what what present did compute send me this month. Right, yeah. And by the way, we used to read all the other magazines too, of course. Creative computing, yeah. Um, we would, all the other magazines would come in and we'd look at them and see what, if our program's better than ours, what are they doing different? Um, so we were all, more or less stealing each other's ideas. We got to meet a lot of people too. You know, we were we were friendly with these staffs at the other computer magazines. You know, I would run into Jim Caporal at the show. We were competitors. He really didn't like it when we started an ST magazine, but you know, we were cordial and friendly with each other and stuff. Uh, the people from um, Creative Computing. Um, one of them was killed in that earthquake out here. Uh, John Anderson. He was an editor at uh, Creative Computing. In fact, after Creative Computing folded, I think he applied for a job at Compute. Uh, we didn't hire him for some reason. And then he ended up going to work for Macworld Magazine, I think, you know, either Macworld or Mac user out here in San Francisco. And then 1989, when they had that Loma Prieta earthquake, right. um, John Anderson and another editor from the magazine were visiting a uh, software company south of Market in San Francisco. And they just come out of the meeting and were getting into their car. They had the doors open. Each of them had like one leg in the car when the earthquake happened. And they like stopped to see what was happening. And then a brick wall collapsed on top of them and killed them both. Um, it was a real shame because he had just moved out to uh, San Francisco. His family was still back in New Jersey, I think. And he had a wife and two kids. He was a young guy. Um, he was a nice guy too. Um, but uh, We've lost several people at Compute too. Keith Farrell died, uh, I think, this last year. He was a features editor at Compute for a long time and a book author. Real nice guy. Good writer, novelist. Um, he's gone now. Um, so things happen over time. Things change. Thank you so much for your time today. So, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me and um, thanks for doing these podcasts. Um, I think it's it's good to have oral histories. I think history is good in general. I'm always a big fan of history of all kinds. Well, good luck to you.